Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Zumbro Watershed Partnerships Waterways Speaker Series. My name is Kevin Strauss. I'm the Education Coordinator for Zumbro Watershed Partnership. For those not familiar with our organization, we're a clean water and flood prevention group here in southeast Minnesota, and we do out education outreach like this. We do uh, working with uh, local area farmers and producers to do conservation on the land, and we do research projects to figure out how to keep the Zumbro River cleaner and safer for everyone who lives here. Um, our speaker for today is Doc Orcharding, and he's a retired engineer from Yagi Coley, and uh, he also has an interest in early 1800s surveying, and he today is going to come to us as Lieutenant Andrew Talcott. So at, at the end of the show, I think Lieutenant Talcott will take uh, questions from the audience as well. And so, thanks a lot. Let's welcome uh, John Orcharding and Andrew Talcott. Thank you, Kevin. I guess I'm... Uh, before I get directly into character, Mr. Borchardt is about 68 years old, so I'm going to pretend I'm Talcott at 68. And that would be 1865, because he was born in 1797. So he's 68 years old, but he's down in Mexico working for the Mexican government, or in particular Maximilian, building a railroad. When I retired from the military in about 1840s, which is, that's the uniform that I'm wearing, Harriet dug that out for me, my wife dug that out for me, found my own uniform to come up here. Uh, when I got the telegram down in Mexico City from Kevin to come up here and talk to you folks, I, I made my way up here. You know, the Transcontinental Railroad wasn't quite completed yet, so I couldn't come that way. So I, it was a long trip, but I made it up. I came up to Mississippi, actually, on a riverboat. That was still one of the basic modes of travel. And unfortunately, Mr. Hilmer's the riverboat did not come up the Zumbro River. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that's the time period, and while I was in Mexico, I had a couple of my kids with me also. Uh, my oldest son, Charles, who was also an engineer at that point, and his career was along with his wife, and had three little kids down in Mexico with me. And then my youngest daughter, Anne, was with us, and she just turned 20 uh, last year, and she just got married last month in October uh, to a guy by the name of Budalowski who uh, is the captain of the Austrian Lancers, and he's down in Mexico as a guard with his troops, or Maximilian, while they're there uh, patrolling Mexico right now. So I've been busy building that railroad down there. I, I understand in your time period that railroad still exists, by the way, that I built in 1865. Uh, this is some of my military career here. This is Calpat. This is me. Uh, 1797, that's my portrait shortly after I graduated from West Point. I graduated second in my class in the military academy in 1818. Uh, when you graduate in the top of your class, you can choose whether or not you want to be regular military or go in the Corps of Engineers. And most of us that are in our upper part of our class choose to go into the Corps of Engineers, and hence the, hence the uniform. Uh, it's a lot better job. You know, we're designing forts and designing uh, a lot of other things around the country. So I've been all over the country designing forts and, and things like that. I designed a fort down in uh, Nebraska, one of the first forts down there, which is where this story today that I'm going to talk about starts. So in 1818, I was promoted to second lieutenant in the Corps. And by 1820, I, was, I made first lieutenant. So my surveying that I've done in my career, uh, I was aide de camp on the staff of Brigadier General Atkinson on an expedition to establish posts. Uh, they were supposed to go all the way up the Missouri River to the Yellowstone River, but unfortunately the steamboats that they sent all their supplies on broke down and ran aground before they got halfway up to Council Bluffs. We wound up reverting to uh, keelboats, uh, similar to the ones Lewis and Clark used, to make it the rest of the way up to Council Bluffs where we stopped and built the fort. That's where I was stationed in the uh, trip that I'm going to cover in a minute. Uh, by 1835, I was doing some boundary work between the states of Ohio and Michigan. There was a little dispute going on there called the Toledo War. Uh, Ohio won, I guess, because they wound up with Toledo being in Ohio, and that's how Michigan wound up with the Upper Peninsula. It's kind of a trade-off for the politics back then. And I had a young guy on my staff and a young lieutenant who just graduated about then from West Point by the name of Robert E. Lee. And, uh, Actually, I wanted to carry it. My wife was a distant cousin of his wife, so we knew each other and we were living on the same coast together, so I knew Robert E. Lee quite well. Uh, in 1840, I was also on the commission to, on the border commission up in the northeast part of the United States. 
on the Boundary Commission up there, did some work up there. In 1852, I came back in this area again as an astronomer and surveyor to run the Iowa-Minnesota border, which is a parallel of latitude. And because of my mathematical genius, and in fact, I had invented a new way of determining latitude by observing the stars as they crossed the, the North Meridian, and even uh, made some changes to some telescopes to, so that they would do that. And my method was known as the Talcott Method, and the Coast and Geodetic Survey actually adopted that as the official way to determine latitude back on these days. So I was hired specifically to come out and survey the border because of that. And moving ahead, here's Harriet, painting of my lovely wife, and a list of our 11 kids. And uh, like I mentioned, Charles was with me in Mexico. Annie, my youngest, our, our youngest two didn't live, actually, uh, when they were born in 1849 and 1851. Uh, so Anne was my youngest. She married this Gustav von Velasquez. Uh, here's what the territory looked like out here in 1818 when I, when I came out here. Uh, we came up the Missouri River and established Fort Atkinson at Council Bluffs, where Lewis and Clark had said it would be a good place for a fort. At the same time, if you remember, does anybody know who was coming up the Mississippi at the same time? Who's the first guy who came up to establish uh, fort, what's now known as Fort Snell? Anybody know? <laughs> Leavenworth? guy by the name of Leavenworth. He was coming up the Mississippi at the same time that I was going from Atkinson up the Missouri. And when I got here, they decided they needed to know how to get between these two posts that they were establishing. So I was on a detail that went across there. Now, there weren't many maps back then. This is a rough map of that area. Here's the Falls of St. Anthony, Mississippi River, the Missouri River here. And they knew there was a river, Des Moines, running up through the middle here somewhere. So this is a pretty crude map, but this is quite a while ago. This is at the time of Lewis and Clark. In fact, Lewis and Clark had a copy of this map with them. But that's about all the mapping that was available in between these two rivers. There wasn't a lot known about that area. So we started out here from the Bluffs. And I mentioned the Des Moines River, the St. Peter River back then. The Minnesota River was called the St. Peter. Uh, here's the Falls of St. Anthony. And I was supposed to map a route in between these two so that they could share troops and supplies if they needed to. So that was one of my first assignments. Here's another map of the Mississippi itself at that time. This is Prairie du Chien existed. Uh, the Falls of St. Anthony again were a known point up here in the St. Peter River. And the Ohio River, of course, in Cincinnati. The river running up to Chicago. That was kind of the river patterns that were known back then. The rivers were the main way to travel back then. That's how everybody got around, it was on river boats or keel boats or barges. So actually, when we came up the Missouri River here to go to Council Bluffs, we actually came from out east, came through Cincinnati, came down the Ohio River, all the way down to Mississippi, came up to Mississippi to St. Louis, and then went up the Missouri from there. With a thousand troops is what we had with us, which was about 20% of the total forces of the United States at that point. But this was shortly after the War of 1812. And there was a lot of fighting went on on the Western Front against the British had the Indians fighting against us during the War of 1812. So we wanted to come out here and try to establish a presence out in this newly acquired Louisiana territory that really wasn't occupied yet. Try to come out here and establish a presence for the fur trade. That was a big uh, commercial venture back then, the fur trade with the Indians. And try to protect that and then also protect our back door from any further assaults by the Canadians. Here's a map that was drawn later, about 1822, by a guy by the name of Long, Stephen H. Long. Uh, Long was actually with us when we came up the river uh, to Council Bluffs. Long had actually designed his own steamboat. He was in the Corps of Engineers also. And he had actually designed his own steamboat for his crew to come up the river with. It only had a draw of about 18 inches. And it actually made it all the way to Council Bluffs, but it was the only smaller steamboat to make it to Council Bluffs. Uh, Long did some more explorations in Minnesota later in 1817. He actually went up to the Falls of St. Anthony. 1823, he actually went all the way up to Pembina, all the way up in northwestern Minnesota, and did a lot of mapping in the area. And this is his rough map of the watershed of the, Missis of the Mississippi and Missouri River that he prepared, a portion of that map. And on his map, since I was with him, he knew I had made this trip. 
is showed by Ralph here. And he also shows a river right here. But it's called the Pine River. That's what you call the Zumbro. It's had several different names. But it's the Pine River, and his sketch here actually matches my maps that I furnished him after I made this trip across here. Here's my orders in Council Bluffs, July 1st, 1820. It's issued orders. You are attached to a party placed under the order of Captain McGee. So Captain McGee was in charge of our group here. And the, for the purpose of exploring the country line between this place and the military post at the mouth of the St. Peter River. I'm sure you can all read this, right? Uh, and for marking a route over the nearest and most practical way. You are charged with surveying and taking notes as close as you can without actually measuring. So we didn't start measuring. We didn't use a chain or a tape to measure this. Our distances were all kind of estimated as we went. Captain McGee and myself and another Captain Kearney who was with us uh, would estimate every day how far we'd gone. And we were marching. Part of the troops were marching. So I'll show you those in a minute. Here's our list of people that were in the party. Captain McGee was in charge of it. He was from the Rifle Regiment. Captain Stephen Watts Kearney. Anybody familiar with Captain Kearney? Kearney, Nebraska. Uh, Kearney was also very active in the Mexican-American War a little later on after this time period. Uh, he also was, the, I believe, the first territorial governor of California. <clears throat> so Kearney got around a lot. And he was actually a, uh, long, but not in charge. Now, this is my map that I drew up. Let's go back here a second and get the other ones. Lieutenant Colonel Will, Willoughby Morgan was along. Again, not in charge. These, these two officers were just kind of along for the trip, I think, just to see where it was. Uh, myself, Lieutenant Andrew Talcott, uh, Lieutenant Charles Pentland, a sergeant, Jeremy Oliver, and there were 14 foot soldiers with us. This is the partial list of it. I can't remember who all the guys were for sure, but I had Samuel, Byrus, Joseph Childer, John Foss, Austin DeForest. Any of you related to any of these? And then we had four servants with us. And yes, back then, those four servants were some of the officers' slaves. Now, I never had slaves. I never had slaves. But Kearney, I think, two of these were actually Kearney's. Cato and James, I think, were Kearney's uh, men that he had with him. And we had an Indian guy and his wife and a papoose with us. It was good to travel back in those days on an expedition like this to have, have your Indian guy with you and even have uh, his wife along with you because it showed you weren't a war party, because women never traveled in a war party. So it was always good when you're traveling like that out in Indian country to have somebody with you. And we had eight pack mules, and we had seven riding horses for the officers and the, and the guy. Uh, so these all were a foot shoulder. These 14 here were all on foot. So they were marching all the way from Council Bluffs up here. Uh, here is my actual map. Uh, that I drew. <coughs> it's pretty hard to see there. But that's a photograph of it. It's in the Virginia Historical Society. Uh, so I, Mr. Borchini has to thank the Virginia Historical Society for preserving some of his records. Uh, his actual map is only, when you pick it up and handle it, this big. So everything he drew was on everything I drew was on this little map that I carried with me, and it was folded up in the back pocket of my leather book, where I kept all my notes, which was a little leather book like this. This is a reproduction that Mr. Borchling has put together, where he's actually traced page by page all the notes of Talcott's, and then bound it up in a book so it could be representative of what it actually looked like except he screwed up, it should be a red cover. And while he was in Virginia, his wife forgot to remind him to take a picture of the book with the red cover. But this is the size of the little book that I carried with me on this trip then and kept all my notes in, and that was the size of the map that was folded up in the back flap of this book uh, as I went that I would draw. And I probably spent quite a bit of time drawing on it actually up at uh, St. Anthony Falls, up in that area there when we were camped up there with Leavenworth. Because I spent almost 10 days there before we came back on the return trip, plotting up my map and doing some calculations so that we had a more direct route back because we got a little bit lost on the way up. 
But that's the map. Here's a blow up of a portion of that map. Here's a, here's a blown up picture of that map here too, colored up if you want to come look at it later. There is a lot of detail. I've got each campsite every night on here. I've got a route on here, these dashed lines. There's a little triangle for each campsite every night where we camp, showing where we camp. So if I start labeling it a little better, and by the way, north is sideways here. In order to get this trip on a nice piece of paper, I didn't keep it straight with the world. So here's the north arrow. All right, so north is this way. Here's the Iowa Minnesota border on the map. That didn't exist at that time. We had it later. The Iowa River down here. We crossed the Cedar River, which we thought flowed into the Iowa River. That's how I grew up back then. And then came on out through here. And when we got up here to Lake Pepin, we finally made our way up here. So we were a little bit off course. We should have been clear over here. And instead, we were clear over here by what's Mason City and Albert Lee now in Austin and went through Olmstead County, which is quite a ways out of the way if you're just trying to go straight to through these two posts. So there's, there's our routes on there. Put some arrows on here so you can see the routes a little better. Our way up in the green and our way back went a more direct route. We've also got a number of Sioux Indian villages labeled on here where we visited different uh, Indian tribes. Chief Redway, uh, Shakopee, uh, I forget who the chief was down at this village down here. Uh, this is a tracing that map so you can see it a little better. And here's the outline of Olmstead County if I put it over the top of that map as best that, as best that we can in the Pine River that I called here, which is actually the Zumber. So you can see our route came up through here. Here's what my first page of my written notes looked like. <coughs> my handwriting wasn't the best then as a young lieutenant. Remember, I'm doing this out in the field, so it's kind of rough going. <coughs> Like July 4th, here's how I kept track of where we're going. Here's my direction. I'm going northeast, northeast, 20, 40 degrees east of north, three miles. Going north, three miles to a creek. North, one mile to the same creek. Crossed it again. Northwest, 10 degrees. <clears throat> three miles to the Boyer River. And north, another mile and a half to a creek. So I record my creek crossings. And I also make some notes down here, but I said here it's good soil. And we went through some timber as we approached the Boyer, principally oak, uh, some hickory. Uh, so I made some notes about it as we went, so that you're just keeping track of the, what's there a little bit. Now, another thing that's, that's uh, very useful is the fact that Kearney, since he wasn't in charge of anything, he kept a diary too. And his diary is in the Missouri Historical Society. Now his, Kearney's more flowery than me, and I'm not going to read much of this, but maybe just a little uh, to give you a little bit of a taste of what Kearney says. I'll wait till we actually get somewhere where it makes sense. Here's a transcribed page of my notes as we start approaching the county. This is field notes July 18th and 19th, 1820. Uh, July 18th, we left our camp, went east one and a half miles to a river about 35 yards wide, two and a half feet deep. A gravel bottom and a rapid current. Our guide thinks it's the St. Peter's. We're actually crossing the Cedar south of Austin. That's a long ways away from the St. Peter River. Here's a composite map of the original government land survey plats. Uh, let me see if I can do this without. Each one of these little squares here is a square mile. All right? Each one of these squares is a township. So this is a compilation of all the original government township plats back in about 1854 when the surveyors come in and surveyed everything before the settlers could start moving in and claim their land and buy it at the land office. And you'll notice they, had, they did some topography on here. They show the rivers. The prairie is in yellow. So they were told to delineate what's out there. So the settlers moving in would know what kind of a farm they were trying to look for. Were we going to locate along a creek? Was it going to be wooded? Did we want to try to find open prairie? <coughs> the white is all wooded. So looking back to 1854, with these maps, we can tell what was here. The Cedar River running up here. Here's Dobbins Breaking, 
Somebody's starting to fire. We've got a squatter, as the surveyors called them. They were in there ahead of us. <coughs> Sometimes building a cabin and starting to plow a field and starting to try to raise a crop or something before the surveyors got there. Then once we came in, we'd locate their cabin for them, or in this case his field. He could go into the land office and make sure he gets title to the section or the quarter section that he decided to start farming before the surveys were there. Uh, most cases have worked out pretty good, especially in rural areas, but in places like Mankato, where a land company went out there and started platting a town without it being tied to a survey and started selling off the pieces, and then they went to try to straighten out title. It took years and years afterwards and a lot of legal claims before they got title straightened out in Mankato. But here was our campsite just along the Cedar River. The next day we took off across the river here in a mile and a half. We went across here. Guess what creek this is? Anybody south of Austin familiar with Oops. creeks? Rose Creek? Yep, that's Rose Creek. We're following right along Rose Creek. Now when we got here and crossed Rose Creek again, we decided to ride south and see if this river kept going this way to see whether or not it was the St. Peter's. And it wasn't. So then we kept going, kept following Rose Creek, and we camped up here for the night, uh, right near uh, Jellystone. Here's a county map of the same area where we went across here, about kind of following Rose Creek, went right through the town of Rose Creek, came up the backside here, just in the open prairie, and camped up here, right where the interstate crosses it actually now. <clears throat> and here's a creek up in that area right now, or approximately where we camped that night. So we're getting close to getting into Olmstead County. The next day we took off, and as we came out across here, I commented in my notes, and so did Kearney in his notes, that we went around a corner of woods, a point of timber, uh, which I tied in my map as though it was a branch of the sun road, but it's not, it's really a branch of the root. This is just at the, approaching the southwest corner of the county here. Uh, but we can de define that point pretty well here on the county map, if that's where we're going. So we're getting close to getting into the county here, down at the southwest corner. And you can see on my sketch, even though this is actually the root running through Stewartville, on my sketch, I thought it kept going into the Pine River, or the Zumbra. So here's the next day we're moving to the southwest corner here. Then we cut on up through Rockdale Township. Across Salem Creek, across the sun row here, across Salem Creek, right in here. I noted that in my notes. We get on up here to King's Run, and we kind of follow that towards the river. And we went a long ways this day. We went 31 miles this day. And we decided, after all this mucking around here down around Rose Creek, and thinking the cedar was a St. Peter, that we were going to take off, and we were going to go northeast until we hit something. Back with the Indian guy, he doesn't know where we're at. In fact, the squaw was crying a couple nights before. They thought we were going to kill him because she knew we were lost. <laughs> <laughs> but after we fed her some soup, she was fine, and they settled down and realized we, were, we weren't going to do anything. Uh, but we came up through here, came right through Rockdale, went on up into here, across the Zunro River at Rockdale. Here's the next day. We keep coming. Come on up through here, hit King's Run. My golf clubs along. We went right through the golf course out there in Northern Hills Golf Course. Went right up through there. It was getting late in the day and we were getting tired. We had gone 31 miles marching. Well, the other guys were marching. I was on horseback. <laughs> but we finally camped right in here, which is about the intersection of 55th Street and 18th Avenue Northwest. Uh, this is where we crossed the, the creek down there. It's on the river, actually. This is looking up. Uh, that wasn't there either. <laughs> We're headed across country here. And here's a knob that I think looks like the likely spot where we were camped. Uh, the 18th Avenue is right behind here. There, there's a mortuary just on the corner here. And this is right along King's Run. And this is where we camped that night. And we were really tired that night. Uh, in fact, let's see what Kearney says about this because it was kind of. Our provisions being nearly exhausted, the uncertainty of our relative situation between ourselves and the St. Peter's, and leaving it in doubt when we shall reach the post at its mouth, we rose early at 5 a.m., took up a line of march. This is starting out that 31-mile day. So we really 
really hooked it along that day. The morning was quite cool and cloudy, and being determined to pursue a northeast course till we strike the St. Peter's or the Mississippi, from either of which we shall be able to ascertain our situation, we steered accordingly. Crossed a ravine, he talks about this point of timber, and another ravine, which here turns at right angles, continued our course, we were, and uh, halted after dark without wood or water. So I don't know, there's trees out there now, but there wasn't back then. Uh, and though supperless and shelterless, we were all soon lost in quiet repose. We made 31 miles today. So that's what Kearney said about that day. Here's my notes then, uh, taking off. This is our campsite uh, from that day. As we take off the next morning, headed up in this direction. And we're going to cross the Zumbo River twice today on the 19th or the 20th as we're going here. We go two and a half miles and we hit the Zumbo River. And uh, during last night we actually had some rain. So we got up early and took off without breakfast and uh, marched, marched up through here. Now as we're going across here, my stuff is bouncing in faster than I am. As we're going across Farmington Township here, we notice something off to the side. And he says this, two miles to the right of our course, discerning a high promontory, and accompanied by Lieutenant T, we rode to it. So we're going up, out across here, and we see this promontory out here. This is the county map that we're talking about. <coughs> up in Farmington Township, just north of, what is this, Potsdam. Just north of Potsdam. When we leave the mortuary area, we camp here, we head up that valley and across the hills. But we look out across the prairie here and we see this knob sticking up. And forget all these other trees, because those are planted by the farmers later. We see this knob sticking up here. And as we approach it, yeah, the flag wasn't there either. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we planted it for all of it. When we got over here, we climbed up on it so we could see around and see where we were at. So we looked back to the west where we come across there. And you got to remember, all these groves were here. Most of these trees are planted. So this was just prairie looking back to the west from the top of this knob. Uh, if we looked to the north, we could see this tree-lined ravine back in here which is uh, Spring Creek that runs into the summer. Well, we could see the tree line back here. So we knew we were headed back to a river bottom. So we could tell that looking north off of this knob. Uh, well, it's just got a nice picture, but it wasn't there yet. I thought it was a nice picture. If you want to buy it, come later, you can see me later. <laughs> Here's another one, too, with a flag in it. Here's one looking east. And again, it's all be just prairie in here. Although, if we'd have trained our telescope a little bit, right in here is a water tower for plain view. Doesn't quite show up on this photograph, but you can actually see it from out there. So, we spent a little time on the knob, but after not really noticing anything, we looked around with the assistance of our spyglass, and we were able to see very great distance in every direction, and those beautiful and interesting objects, Kearney's really flowery here, were presented to us. We were not able to gain any satisfaction where we were. So we just continued our course and we headed down into the river bottom. So here we're leaving the knob behind. So you can see it really sticks up if anybody's been up there around Potsdam. You can see this dam. Although Cap X just went through here about a mile north, a half mile north of us, so it might be ruining the view now. So here we are. We followed this creek down into the river bottom and camp down here. By anybody know the little town of Jarrett? In fact, I don't think it's even an incorporated town, but that's where we camped that night. The next morning we got up, oh, we had something to eat here too. Let me describe the river bottom here at uh, Jarrett. Um, actually, my notes described it too. Here's where the, the creek comes down into the river bottom, right here. So here's where we camped on that. We crossed over and camped on the other side of the bank here. Um, So when we came 
came down in here, we were getting running low on meat, but our guide shot something for us that we had to eat that night. Anybody want to take a guess what he shot? No. No? Deer? No. No. It flies. No. Geese. The guy shot a couple of geese for us that night. So the geese were here in 1820. They were already here in the river bottom here at Jarrett. What kind of geese were they? Just Canadian geese. And uh, so we had those to die on that night before we left Jarrett and climbed up onto the valley here. Then as we climbed up out of here, we kept heading northeast. We headed over here and we came into this nice little valley here that was described as a handsome valley 250 yards wide by Kearney. He had a really good description of that valley. And if you're driving Highway 60 now, if you come down through here, you can see that pretty little valley. So it's a perfect description of where they were at. About the time they got to where the church sits, though, they decided the valley was starting to head east and they wanted to keep going more north. So we pulled out of the valley there and went up and over the hills here. So we came up out of the valley here, came up to the top of the hills, and got back on our course. So we were on a more northeasterly course. And we finally then wound up at Lake Pepin. We came over the top of the hill, and we could look ahead here and see we were at Lake Pepin. So we were finally glad that now we kind of knew where we were at. When we got to Lake Pepin, we met a couple of Indians, and that they were out in the lake at noon. And there was a boat on the other side of the lake there that actually had some supplies. So we actually borrowed the Indian's canoe and rowed across the lake to get some supplies from the boat that was over there. So we got some, uh, let's see, what did we get? We got some whiskey, I think we got some pork, and uh, a couple of other things that we could eat while we were over there uh, from that other boat. So we were supplied for a little bit. Here's the valley that we kind of came down when we got to the lake there, uh, right at the north edge or south edge of Lake City. And here's what the lake looked like looking across from where we hit the lake. See the bluff across here? Uh, there was a boat over there, but not this one. <laughs> uh, and everybody tells the story of the lake here about it made the rock. I mean, every we heard the story, Leavenworth heard the story, Long heard the story. Uh, everybody hears the story of, of, of that when they come through there. So it's been around a long time. Here's another page of my notes then, the next day as we're leaving, uh, running along the lake here. As we camp there, one of the Indians stayed with us and kind of guided us along a little further there as, as we went up along the lake. Uh, the lake happened is right here, so my sketch is getting pretty rough. And we worked our way on up here to our next camp, up here, which is that red lake. And we talked about our, our trip here. And then one thing I was going to do about it here was, in order to keep track of where we're at, I would take readings with a sextant. And it was a sextant very similar to this right here, just a five-inch sextant, not very big. And I would take readings on a couple of stars and then calculate our latitude. And by that, I could kind of keep track of how far we'd gone also. So like the first couple of nights after we were out, coming up uh, uh, from uh, the bluff there, uh, Kearney and I got together. We'd been estimating distances, and I took a reading with, uh, with my sextant and kind of calculated the distance, and we adjusted. We'd been overestimating our distance a little bit based on the difference in latitude that I was getting. But that's how we kept track of it, was by stars. Keep track of where we're at north-south. We could get a pretty good handle of where we were at, just using the sextant. That was very popular back then for keeping track of where we are. Lewis and Clark had sextants with them. Uh, keep track of their map here. Keep track of their latitude. So as we go on up along the river here, we go on up on the 21st, northeast 20 degrees along the river, 5 miles, northwest of the 3 miles, northeast another 5 miles and so many miles to the Mississippi at the lake. So this is how we got to the lake. These are notes actually from the previous page. Now on the 22nd, we're headed up along the lake here, northwest, running parallel with the lake. And then it's northwest 80 degrees. Here again is on the maps. 
uh, the original government maps. Now there's more cabins and stuff showing up here along Lake Pepin at the time of the government survey. You can see one here. Red Wing was already platted, starting to be platted uh, at the time of the government survey. So we got up here and camped there. And we camped as we came up through here, came on the back side of Frontenac State Park. There's a little valley there that are described in our notes that we followed coming up through there. And then followed right where 61 runs now, kind of on the back side. We got away from the lake here a little bit. And we wound up here at, at the bluff up here. Here's the painting of, their, uh, of the bluff, Byron's Bluff, and the second bluff here where the park is now up there. And here's the Red Wings Indian Village over in this area right here in this painting. Uh, this was done from a lithograph in about 1855. This from the Historical Society. Now, one person we ran into there was the Sioux Chief Red Wing. And we camped a ways away from him to begin with, from his Indian camp. But he came over to our camp and he said, oh, you got to come and camp with us. I want you to camp, camp right with us. So he was kind of chagrined even that we weren't going to camp with him. So he invited us in his TV and us officers, and they fed us really well uh, with venison and some parched corn. Uh, they had some cornfields there of their own. Uh, chief Redman here was, he's a succession of the Midwakan chiefs, and he's kind of named for the red dye that he used uh, to dye the swan's wings for his head bonnet. And he was really an ally of the British soldiers during 1812 to begin with. So he's fighting with the British against them. But he had a vision about this time where he saw the Americans driving out the British and he decided he better take a stance of neutrality. Chief Wabashaw, too, uh, was more inclined to be with us after that point, too. <coughs> Although Wabashaw was actually head of this area and Red Wing was a lower chief. So, but during his lifetime, there weren't that many pioneers in that, red, in that area. But he was known as a firm friend of the United States in keeping the peace with the settlers and trading goods that were valued by his tribe. So Red Wing was a chief we spent some time with there. And even after he laid out so much food, the officers couldn't eat it all. And he says, well, you can take it back to your troops. You, know, you don't need to leave anything here. You can go feed the rest of your troops. And he even came back to our tent later uh, with a deer head for us. I think a deer head is a bit of a delicacy for the natives, but, but he brought us a deer head later on. So he was being very friendly. He was also very friendly when uh, Young was up here later on. He made a speech where he presented a pipe and a pouch and a buffalo skin, and uh, he appeared to be a man of, a man of uh, good sense and promised to accompany him on up to the St. Peter's when Long came along a couple years later and went up through here. So that's great. Here's another early picture of Barn Bluff. Near Red Wing. Here's back to our map now. We really, we're done going through the county. Here's on a state highway map just to show you where we went in Minnesota. So you can see where, where all we were. Uh, one thing I was going to do was read a little better description while we're in Olmstead County crossing the river as to what we actually talked about here. Uh, when we hit the Zumbro the second time. The first time, actually, where we hit it was down by the quarry. We stopped and had lunch there. And we noted how deep it was and everything. But here, when we hit it up by Jared, we really talked about it a little bit. Uh, we descended a very steep declivity, and following a ravine for a short distance, we reached the river. It's 30 yards wide, 5 feet deep, with a stony bottom. And we halted on its banks, remained until sundown, then we crossed over to the north side and camped for the night, having made 11 miles. The river was well bordered by oak, pine, white ash, and slippery elm. And in its vicinity, we discovered sand and limestone formations. Uh, it even says during the afternoon that uh, men were involved in fishing, but they didn't, kind of didn't catch anything because they wound up eating the three geese that the uh, Indian guy uh, shot from. Uh, the next morning, we didn't get up very early. It says, in consequence of a little fog on the water or some other cause equally as unimportant, we remained till 8 a.m. And this was unusual, because once it was daylight, we were here to travel. So it was four or five, whenever it got daylight, we were up and moving. And we usually didn't eat a breakfast right away. We usually went away first and then stopped and had breakfast before we ate. 
And then, then we could continue. But that was his description of the river bottom up there at Jarrett, the different trees and everything that were there at that time. So, here we did visit the uh, Falls of St. Anthony while we were up there. And here's a painting uh, that I found of the falls. That's a really pretty rendition of it. Actually, Father Hennepin is in the painting here, standing here with gaze at the falls. So it was quite a, quite a feature, although Kearney, when he came up uh, to the falls with us and visited it, he didn't have too much to say about it. In fact, he was kind of disappointed, he wrote in his diary. He was disappointed at, at the falls because the Indians and the natives in the area held it at such high reverence and everything that he expected it to be more. But then he went on to say, I think it's because I've been to Niagara Falls that I wasn't quite as impressed. He, he expected something to be a little more like Niagara Falls, and it really wasn't as, as big as uh, Niagara. Uh, I'm going to switch to another. Another PowerPoint here. And we're going to talk a little bit about the river itself and some of the mapping. Okay, here's a map you should be familiar with here, jumping to current time. This is your trail, trail map uh, that I scanned in here of the river. Mississippi over here, Sunboro, the lake, coming all the way through. So this is your trail map. And I've done a little analysis with this. I went back and I started with, this is the first kind of mapping of the Mississippi River uh, by a guy by the name of Zebulon Pike who was up the river about the same time as Lewis and Clark. You always hear a lot about Lewis and Clark, but you don't hear that much about Zebulon Pike. Zebulon actually just missed being with Lewis and Clark. He was at Fort Massac down in the, on the Ohio River when Lewis and Clark came through recruiting troops. But he was already married. They were not taking married. They only took one married guy, and that was a blacksmith, because they needed a blacksmith. They wanted young men that had no attachment, that could live off the land because they knew they were going to be gone, gone a long time and that's what they were going to have to do. But Pike came up to Mississippi the year that Lewis and Clark were going across the mountains. And you'll see here, he does talk about a river here, but he calls it the Clear River. And I think what he's referring to here is the Whitewater. And he shows another branch coming in right near there, right across from the Buffalo River. He shows another branch coming in. He's just locating the rivers as he intersects and going, the, going up the river. So here's a, one of the very early maps that show about where that river, where the Zumbro comes up. Here's another map in 1817. And this is Major Long's trip up the river in 1817. And he shows, he shows the Clearwater Creek coming in here. And right at the same point, almost, he shows the River Desembaris. The River Desembaris, which is what it was called. That's a French name, and I think that means it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's a river of difficulty uh, because of down trees and everything in the area getting in here. And maybe you'll see why when we look at this later. Here's my map again. I oriented the true north this time with the Pine River in here and my trail through here, just showing my map of this now in 1820. So 1817, or 1820, or yeah, 1817. He didn't map much of it here. He just shows the outlet here. But uh, notice how he shows it curving around the outlet. Curves clear down south and comes in with the Whitewater River. And then here's my map showing the pine, which is the Zumbro again. And because I had crossed these branches, you know, this is the root river that I went by right here that I thought went into the Zumro. Here's the one creek of the Zumro, one branch of the Zumro. Here's Salem Creek, or another branch. And in here, I must have guessed that there was another one coming in between here. So it's kind of obvious that the river grows that much between the two, there got to be something else coming in here. So, I mean, those are how we mapped back then. We didn't, didn't actually survey the river. Now here's one I showed right at the beginning a little bit. Here's an 1822 map of Longs showing my route, my route going back now that I went back on a correct route. Uh, and again, he shows my river, the Pine, from my notes, from my map that I furnished him, called the Pine River. Cannon River is labeled. Uh, he, he shows another river south of it here. The Root River is labeled in here, Upper Iowa River. <coughs> So those are the rivers.
years that were kind of known back then in this area. This is 18, early 1820, shortly after I was here in 1820. Now we're going to jump to Minnesota as a territory. Here's a ter first early territorial map of Minnesota, about 1847, I believe this is. These are the counties. This is Waukesha County, ran all the way up the Missouri River. Minnesota Territory ran to the Missouri River when it was a territory. That got cut off when it became a state. But it was originally established as a territory, it went all the way to the Missouri. So you could say Lewis and Clark went through Minnesota Territory. Because it became Minnesota Territory after Lewis and Clark had been there, obviously. But it ran all the way out here. We got Dakota County. Wabasha County, Wanahat, Wanahat, Makahata, Tambina, Tambina. We got Itasca. And in this part, because it's on the other side of the river, it was a little more developed. We have Washington County, uh, we have Benton, and we have Ramsey. So those are the initial counties. And here, if we blow it up and we look at what we got in our area now, now we got a Waza Oja River. Waza Oja River on the map, on the territorial map of Minnesota. And it's kind of connected with the Minnesota River, which is the white part now. But it's got some pretty good shape to it here as far as the extra branches. I mean, here's the main river coming out, there's the North Fork. No Fork, South Fork. I've got a little more data now. They're starting to actually map it. Somebody's actually mapped it. Here's the next territorial map. And they're starting to split it up into a few more counties. Wabasha, this is just a couple years later. Wabasha got cut off now into a smaller county. And the rest of this is Dakota County all the way up here yet. You still have your first three here, Washington, uh, Ramsey, and uh, Benton. Still have Itasca up here. Convenient now took this over. They got rid of these other two counties that had in here for a while. Now let's see if the rivers are any different on this map. They're almost identical to the previous one. So the base map must not have changed. They were just updating the counties. Because it's almost identical to the other one. Now here's an 1847 map that was probably the basis for those two territorial maps. And this was actually called the Provisional Geographic Map of the Chippewa Land District. And it included most of Wisconsin and, and part of Minnesota. And it was actually surveyed by a guy by the name of Lieutenant Fremont. Actually did some survey work in here. And you can see he's getting, he's getting some pretty good data in here now. It's starting to look like the river as we know it today. But it's still coming in down here with the white line. He's still calling it the Wazioja. And he's calling this the Mini Haka. And you can see that Mini Haka River coming in. So the names are still different. This is 1847. They were actually inventorying the woodland out here at that point. The lumber industry was really booming during this time period. And the different colors on the map represent different types of woodland. Here's another map done by Nicollet. A little more detail yet on the map. He's showing a few more uh, creeks coming into it. This is a little later then, close to 1850s, uh, when Nicollet produced his map of Minnesota. So here he is here. But the names are still there. Wasi, Wasi Oja, Oju. In fact, in one place I see Oju, and here it's an A. Uh, Minnesota River here yet again. And they still show it all connecting up here before it goes into the Mississippi. Now here's the actual government flats. All of those combined government flats of your whole watershed. This green line is an outline of your watershed uh, well, put on this, just using these government flats, which I think matches pretty close mm -hmm. uh, with what what you've got the maps today for your watersheds and based on the government plats. And the government plats were tying down the rivers as they went. But remember, they really didn't traverse along the river and measure exactly all the bends in the river. 
All they were doing was laying out what? They were laying out square miles. So they only surveyed every, the edge of every mile. So they only tied down the river when they crossed it, when it went across that mile line. And in between, if they could see it, they could kind of sketch it. Some of them got a little creative, so they got a lot of uh, curves in the river and stuff in between. So you got to remember that it's not, it's only accurate within a mile, you know, of where they crossed it. And what I'm going to do now is blow these up. This is the government plat here, this township over on the river. This is the township on the river here. Here's the river, and I've highlighted the river channel here already. Now, uh, this is down at the uh, outlet. So let's see what's going on here. Once I did some tracing here. Here's the main channel as shown on the government plat. It doesn't come in Kellogg, by the way, to Orient, it just sits right here. The town of Kellogg sits right here. The river goes right in there right now. Here's where it went, 1853, 1854. They did not even show any major cross connections here. There's a lot of other stuff going on. They got some back channels in here, there's an extra channel here. There's an extra channel there where it was flowing. There's a double channel there. If you ever drive that little county road going through here, this is all low flood land through here. So they show some back channels. All right, put it over your map. How does it fit your map today? Not too bad. Look at where it went. It went through the McCarthy Lake water management area. That's where the old original channel went. And then it tied into the Weaver Bottoms down there. <coughs> Just north of the Whitewater. That's where it was back in the 1850s. Here's a little closer view even of the outlet. Let's trace the river as it left. Here's the Whitewater River leading down here, about a mile apart there. There's actually a little bit of a cross channel going in between. There's that other channel there. Here's how it looks on an aerial map today. <clears throat> you can see that, it's a little dark. Here's Weaver. If you're driving along Highway 61 here, one of the old back channels for the Zumbro ran right along the road in here. And then went in the river out here, across from Buffalo City. Oh, well, interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's move up a little further north by Kellogg. These were all cabins shown on the original government plat. All these red, red five-sided figures uh, were existing cabinets in 1853 and 1854. Here's the channel. Here's the aerial photo of that area. Some of these are still, I won't get it very close, to existing farmsteads today in this valley here in particular. Some of those cabins apparently turned into farmsteads. Whether the cabins are still there or not, would be interesting to know. There was one right here at the corner of Kellogg. There was a log cabin in that area, 1853. A couple of log cabins up here on 61. I would guess the highway and the railroad probably took care of that. But the river fits pretty good on this area. Here's the river winding its way through here, and the red mark is where it was in the 1850s. So it gets here, and now it's been straightened and taken out here. All right, let's move upstream towards Rochester. Here's the next couple of government flats, moving our way up the river here. So there's the main channel. Oh, here's another line that shows up. In fact, by the way, let me back up a second, because that line is short run here. Yes, it does. Here's another line that shows up running here. Anybody want to guess what that is? That's the Indian half-breed line, half-breed reservation that was laid out and reserved for the offspring of the half-breed offspring of the Dakota Indians. This was done, this was created pretty early, like 1825, they actually described this, but it never really got surveyed and implemented like it should until after the government survey came in. And then they did actually survey these sidelines, and there are government lots along here, and there are still some ownership lines that follow those lines. There are still some ownership lines out there today that follow that half feet reservation line. And it's right in the middle of your watershed. It goes right through the middle. It goes back 15 miles from the river, from here, and 15 miles back from Barnes Bluff, and the line in between. 
So now moving on to this next township, here's the half-breed line running through this township. So these two townships. This is the township here, and this is the next township here. Here's what your map looks like in that area. Follows the river pretty close. Considering they only tied it down every mile when they went across it, that's a pretty good, pretty good fit with the blue line and the and the dashed red, which was the early, early survey. All the way down here to Jarrett again, where we went across uh, the river during our trek. Hammond sitting down here. Moving on up to the next next piece of river where it branches off. We get to the branch. Guess what I drew on there? What do you think that might be? Stagecoach road. Which road? Dubuque Trail. Dubuque Trail. That's the Dubuque Trail. It shows on the government plats. Running through here. Here's that junction of the sub road, the first branch here. So it's off to the west of that. In fact, right here, you can't, can't read it. I'll blow this up and I'm going to figure out how to blow up that. There was actually a log cabin there and it was labeled, was it Dobbins Hotel? There was actually a hotel on the stagecoach line right out in here. Here's the aerial, or not the aerial, but your map again over that same area. So the junction of the rivers. River heading down through the lake. So not too bad compared to the surveys back in 1853. You can't see where the trail is over here now. And that uh, hotel sits right near County Road 11. I believe it is going by there in this section here. In fact, here's a blow up of the junction of the river here. The Zumbro coming in here. And this is what? North Branch, North Fork. North Fork of the Embarrass River. This is what the government surveyors called it in the 1850s. So this is a North Fork right here. So we'll color that in, color in that branch, put it over an aerial. Here's the log cabins that were out there at the time, too. A few log cabins. They're kind of out in the woods here yet. Some of them might, one of them might be there yet. But still a pretty good match for that area. Here's that hotel I was talking about. Dodson's. Dodson's. Dodson's Hotel. Sitting on that St. Paul Road right here. The Butte and St. Paul Road. There's also a clearing down here where they're saying the farm. There's a couple other cabins off this township too. One up here. And another one down here. And somebody's clearing the field down this section here too. There was the road. Here's the map, or your map. So this is actually Google Earth on the top. So here's this whole hotel out here now, along this county road. I don't know if it's near this farm site right here. That's where it actually is. <coughs> oh, come on down further south along the river, come down to the next branch. So where are we here at this branch, at this fork here? It just dried up the lake, right? That's our Noco. And here's the trail going again through those townships. Roads went across just below the dam in our Noco and kept going. That's where the St. Paul to the Duke Road went. And these, this comes up here with the fork here and then it branches into these two branches, right? And what's out here? Town. Manderville. This is Manderville already. Manderville was in existence at the time of the original government plats, 1854. So here's your map over that same area. <coughs> the river fits pretty good for your map again from the government survey. Uh, I had to patch this together up here. So here's the middle fork up here. So it fits the maps pretty good. And moving on, here we're coming out into the South Fork. Here's Willow Creek. Here's the map coming through Rochester. Golden Hill. Here's the river, South Fork. 
and Salem Creek and Willow. Here's a bluff of right in Rochester here now. There was a mill site here in Rochester, located right here. This is a township map. This township corner is right up by RCTC. Here's the river. It's Bear Creek. Here's the area. So here's where that mill site was. It's right here about where the 4th Street Bridge is. Here's like kind of pinned it down. The map didn't really show the exact mill. It showed, kind of showed the dam and the words. In. Like there was an old mill race that ran in through here behind the fire station. There's an old mill race that ran there that took water from upstream and ran through the mill. It shows up on survey plants in the area too. 